So the media, okay? I I did complain to Jake Payne. Uh, told him he was a corporate media and he was bought and paid for and that he didn't actually care about the truth. He wasn't giving a fuck about the solutions to the problems. He just cares about the sensational bullshit so he can make a dollar off the corporate advertisers. And I get it. He's a business. He's trying to make money. But you are what you are. And you want to be somebody who's against mainstream media while you're very much mainstream media? You're the gatekeeper, Jake Payne. Whatever you don't put out there... It's, it's totally irrelevant because you put everything out there, it seems like. But it, that's not true now, is it? You don't put everything out there. Not all the crimes of Louisville are being put out there. Right now, they're trying to get donations to have an ad-free project. That's their solution. And they want uh, your money. So still, they want money. Give us your money so we can do this. Uh, to have an ad-free experience. And, you know, be a sensational, you know, blowhard. Just don't say that, you know, you're a good person. Just say you're a capitalist pig who's just trying to make money, as much money as you can for yourself, and fuck everybody else. It is in your self-interest for poverty to continue. It is in your self-interest for all these bad issues and all this crazy depravity and all these sensational stories and all this insanity to, con to carry on and to continue. So you can sell more newspapers and more blood. The, the more papers you sell, if it bleeds, it leads. That's how sensational journalism works. And if you know anything about history, there's always going to be bad shit that happens. It's got to be, uh, we got to have a serious discussion about the causes of such things. Uh, but more importantly, we need to focus on the positive effects that people do, the, the long struggles and the committed struggles that brought, bring about change. And we need to highlight these folks and treat them like heroes. And if there's no news in the day, we don't need to be looking for news where it don't exist. Canada has the media where they all say, and this new crossing guard was hired today. That's news in Canada, a crossing guard getting hired. That should be news here in America, too. I would like to know if there's crossing guards getting hired here. I'd like to know more about my local government officials. I also think the, the garbage workers and the uh, TARC buses should strike. They shut this whole town down and get whatever they demanded. Whatever they demanded, whatever the TARC buses and the garbage workers wanted, they'd get and anybody else that would join them, because I think they would shut this whole town down. The firefighters, the police, they're all union too. So, unions ain't all bad. So, yeah, the, that's uh, Jake Payne is trying this new project right now. That's what he's trying to do. Donate your money so we, we can put out a, an ad-free experience. Man, no one's going to just donate money. Um, some things I want to talk about. Oh, uh, Kentucky. Kentucky is weird. I got this book called Weird Kentucky. So I was going to read a couple of the stories. I guess I'll go with like the um, the more all current ones. There's a, there's a lot of violence and insanity. Um, there's Melungeons here, which were some black folks, black and white folks, who pretended that they were Portuguese who lived out in eastern Appalachia. Come to find out they're actually African American. There's blue people in Kentucky. They have actual a blue complexion. Uh, uh, the few gates, but there's, they say there isn't any more. I'll come back to those if I got time. Okay, here's, here's, uh, one of Kentucky's craziest. Now, Kentucky is, is known for, um, I mean, we're number one with insanity, but the Hatfield and McCoy's violence and backwardsness, so we, we do have a kind of a rough rep reputation. Now, it's rooted in some truth. I don't know. We got a lot of it's poor education and poor upbringing. We like our unique selves, but I think that our politicians have failed us. I assume they're all professional corruptionists since uh, William Justice Goble was slain. Kentucky hadn't had a chance since. Our uh, next New Dealer, Gatewood Galbraith, where's he at? He's dead in the ground now. He would have solved a lot of problems. Did Jake Payne give a shit about that? Gatewood and Jake Payne basically believe the same things. They're both for gay marriage. They're both against poverty, against the war, against the Patriot Act. Uh, both Democrats. They're both for social spending. Why the fuck would you treat Gatewood and Galbraith like he was a fucking dickhead? You treated Curtis Morrison like he was a dickhead, too. In fact, there has probably been... Uh, Jake Payne has stopped more progressives from running in Louisville than any Republican or corporation ever has. Fuck Jake Payne. Fuck the media. But fuck Jake Payne because he's the gatekeeper for the corporate media. So, okay. Murray's Vampire Clan. Rod Farrell out of Murray, Kentucky. 
The kids growing up in Madison County during the 1980s and 1990s often told stories about a vampire cult that practiced ritual blood drinking. Most were no doubt just fantasizing, but who knows for sure how many of them tipped over the edge from fantasy to reality. A prime example would be the so-called vampire clan from Murray, headed by a teenager named Rod Farrell. Rod Rod Farrell and his goth pals were obsessed with the vampire-themed role-playing game and ultimately completely lost touch with reality. Rod, or Visago, as he liked to be called, since Visago is a 500-year-old vampire that he uh, uh, called upon to become or some shit. And his cohorts quickly escalated their game to drinking each other's blood, and if that wasn't available, the blood of some poor pet. The kid's strange obsessions would eventually progress to humans. So this is just like Jeffrey Dahmer. He was killing the neighborhood kittens and the cats. And then he uh, that bloodlust wasn't good enough for him. And he had to go on to humans. Jeffrey Dahmer also got a sexual thrill out of murder. So this is important. We got a lot of insanity here in Kentucky. A lot of insanity is happening right now. You got that Batman movie that came out. The zombie apocalypse. That guy eating that dude's face. And then... That other guy in Canada who's passing out body parts to the liberal and the Republican parties. And, uh, you know, this is uh, we got the internet too, so you you can't keep all this uh, lid on all this stuff that's happening, and a lot of craziness. So, a prime example. Let's see. Uh, the kids' strange obsessions would eventually progress to humans. They loaded up the car for a vampire road trip for the purpose of murdering Ruth Queen and Richard Windorf of Estes, Florida. They're the parents of Henry Windorf. So these vampire kids go out and kill the, these parents in a very heinous way. Um, Rod Farrell was sentenced to death and when, at, was at one point the youngest person ever to be on death row, which is an unfortunate first for Kentuckians, but in 2000 his sentence was overturned to life without parole. He is utterly unapologetic for his deeds and will bore anyone who cares to listen with his claims of being either a 60,000-year-old demon, a 500-year-old vampire, or Satan himself, depending on which way the gears in his troubled mind grind. Today, very few people in Murray are willing to talk about the cult. To Madison County. Murray and Madison County are willing to talk about the cult. No one wants to dredge up unpleasant memories of such a monumentally stupid and horrible crime crew. The kids' favorite hangout, an old concrete building in the land between the lakes area, nicknamed the Vampire Hotel, has been torn down and fenced off in hopes of eradicating all traces of the memory of the cult. People still make the pilgrimage to the site, leaving tacky gifts and quasi-occult graffiti. Exactly what they intend to commemorate with all this is anyone's guess. So, so people love... Kentuckians are loving Rod Farrell. They got some sort of marker. There's a fast food strip search, which happened in Mount Washington. The prankster told the manager that she needed to bring an 18-year-old female employee into the office and order her to remove all her clothing except for an apron, ostensibly because she was accused of stealing someone's purse. Now, you may be noting that the logic here is already fuzzy, but wait, it gets even fuzzier. The manager called home and asked her fiancé to come to the store and help her out with the matter, an idea that was sanctioned by the police officer on the phone. So, that's how obedient people are. They call McDonald's in Mount Washington, and it's uh, they're saying, I'm a police officer, and someone stole your uh, uh, purse, and you need to go check this person. Strip search them because they stole a purse. I know the purse is on there. It needs to be strip searched. Strip everything. Leave her apron on, but strip everything else. And the manager's a woman, right? She calls her fiancé, so they call her up, and they make sure that, you know, there's somebody else that's going on. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But eventually, what happened to the victim? Let's see, the call was made with the calling card police eventually were able to trace it to a correctional facility worker so this is a prison worker a guy in prison <laughs> was the one who said this a uh, a prison guard who's now going to be i guess in the prison who was arrested and extradited to kentucky to stand trial so it came from a payphone in florida a prison guard from florida called somebody up in kentucky then he was arrested and the victim after years of litigation she finally emerged victorious against mcdonald's in October 2007, a jury awarded her $6.1 million in punitive damages and court costs. $61 million. If you knew that, if you got strip search illegally at McDonald's, would you know to sue them to make $6.1 million? I get tired of people getting mad about them making money about the coffee spill. You know what? Fuck McDonald's. If you could have made money by spilling fucking hot-ass coffee on yourself, why didn't you? Why didn't you? They should uh, use due caution. They should make sure that their coffee isn't burning everybody. This is something that should happen. Kentucky also uh, produced the real inventor of the radio, Nathan Stubblefield. 
Nathan Stubblefield was the first inventor of the radio. Some Kentuckians don't get no respect. Nathan Stubblefield, he was born in 1860. Stubblefield was an, an eccentric melon farmer from Murray. He was a voracious reader, and he styled himself as a self-taught scientist and inventor. As early as 1885, Nathan had invented several different wireless telephone devices. And wire telephony is, of course, the whole point of radio. The, this was years before Marconi got official credit for inventing the radio. Even without Stubblefield, Marconi still wouldn't be the true inventor of the radio. Nikola Tessa invented it well before Marconi, who in fact uses Tesla's patents as research materials. In 1892, Stubblefield performed the world's first wireless broadcast in Murray, transmitting speech and music. Later, he gave a very successful demonstration on the Potomac, the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. So, and then he didn't get credit for it. He died as a poor man. Right? That's uh, Nathan Stubblefield. Nathan Stubblefield out of Kentucky invented the radio. Kentucky invented the radio. We invented a radio, you know? Like, Kentucky? Like, backwards Kentucky? Yes, backwards Kentucky. Backwards, hillbilly, racist, poor, toothless, meth-faced Kentucky. They invented the radio. We're capable of great things. Well... Speaking of being capable of great things, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, the worst example of Kentucky that we have, well, I guess one one that I didn't come across, but Michael Carneal was a white kid in 97, I want to say, who went to a prayer group, shot a bunch of girls in the prayer group. He was one of the first uh, school shootings when Paducah happened. This is before Columbine, but this is when a white kid did it, and all of a sudden it became big news. There's been violence in black neighborhoods for a long time, but when it was in white America, then it became a, a problem. And Paducah, Kentucky was, I want to say, one of the first white school shootings. At least it started a whole rash of them. There's been a, a shitload of school shootings. Uh, Charles Manson came out of Kentucky. Charles Manson, the man who uh, stopped the 60s from succeeding, stopped the hippie movement, made it seem like, man, if we all had freedom, then people would just turn crazy like Charles Manson. Charles Manson's a Kentucky boy, raised by a Confederate, Uncle Jesse, stuck in prisons when he was like 15 years old for writing a bad check, getting raped in these prisons, in these uh, boy camps, and uh, that's what created Charles Manson. But the name Charles Manson invokes second only to Hitler's as a generic expression of evil, often by people who don't really know what the whole helter-skelter thing was really about. Contrary to popular belief, Mason was not an Ohioan, but a Kentuckian. His family lived in Ashland and simply chose a hospital nearby Cincinnati for the birth in 1934. Charlie's mother, Kathleen Maddox, was only 16 and unwed when Manson was born. He was later to be determined to be the son of a mysterious Colonel Scott. <coughs> Colonel Scott, who was ordered to pay Maddox the princely sum of $5 per month for his support. Reportedly, the colonel didn't come through on even that meager payment. In his youth, Manson spent a lot of time in and out of boys' reformatories, special homes, and jails, which kept him shuffled around the country from West Virginia to Indiana to Washington, D.C. to California. Along the way, there was a little armed robbery, a lot of other crimes, and a lot of guitar playing. Manson idolized the Beatles and the Beach Boys and even auditioned to be a member of the Monkees. Hanging out in California during the 1960s, he set up an apocalyptic Manson family cult in the desert. Kill, uh, got his underlings to kill Sharon Tate and you know all the rest and he's still in jail 77 years is up for parole and he's still in jail so Manson will never get his freedom Manson didn't kill a single person and since Manson since the 70s we're going to say Carter after Carter is Reagan, Bush, Clinton Bush, Obama they've all killed people all throughout the world lots of people, thousands of people so American presidents can uh, assassinate and terrorize and murder as many people as they want to murder, but if some Kentucky kid who's been messed up their entire life goes to California and tries to start a race war by sending his uh, uh, women who's underneath him as underlings to do the, his dirty work, that's a crime and that should be dealt with. But the uh, the glaring discrepancies, how are we going to hate this person who never killed anybody and we are going to celebrate this person who killed lots? Probably the worst villain that come out of Kentucky, and I don't know if I have much time for him, but Donald Harvey, the Angel of Death. He killed over a hundred Kentuckians. 
and he did it very secretive, very secretly. And if you don't know anything about uh, nursing homes or hospitals or uh, uh, mental wards, you should read up because they're not good places. Many times they are just prisons for people that nobody gives a fuck about. And, uh, you know, people like a nurse can end up killing hundreds of people. Angel of Death, Donald Harvey. Maybe coming up, I don't know.